any excuse to drive Lori's minivan. That's that's what Jorgen said. Any excuse to drive. I hear that's the that's the hot ticket. So good morning, church. Uh, a couple things real quick for the guys uh, that went to the retreat this weekend. Some came back last night. Some came back this morning. Any little 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 soundbite you want to give us, uh, Josh or Cameron or anyone? Just what was a big takeaway for you? That's awesome. Any other feedback from anyone that went up yesterday? I heard that they had a Nerf gun battle where the only rule is you had to shoot each other in the face, which is, my, that's my kind of, like, the opposite of what we teach our kids, right? Like, go for the eyes, go for, you know. Cameron. <laughs> that's my idea of bonding right there. Yeah. We, there's footage of this, right? Maybe we can put that together, put it on the website or uh, something. <laughs> hmm. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Um, real quick, too, before we dive into the word, I, you know, you guys are just such a generous church, and I... Um, I, I am not a sh afraid to just almost brag about you guys to other churches and other pastors and other ministry because your generosity is one of those things that's just unexpected and it is, uh, it's unique. And I just want to just praise God uh, for you and your generosity to this, this ministry and, and to let you know we are, we are praying about what's next. And by that question what's next we're going before God saying God do you want us to start another church do you want us to church plant do you want us to do another coffee house church plant ministry if so where is that and and we started gathering at our house once a month just to pray with leadership and you need to know that we are actively seeking the heart of God to say what's next and maybe five years ago if you would have asked me can you do this again I would have told you no because it just took everything out of me but right now, I'm sitting there going, man, maybe we're positioned and poised to take a group of people and do this thing yet again, to reach more people with the love of Jesus Christ, because that's the aim, and that's the goal. And so thank you for just not only providing resources so that we can really dream big, but pray with us so that we can just really storm the throne room of heaven and just ask God, what, what would you have us do? What would you have us do to take the resources that may have incredible earthly value, but how can we leverage them for eternal value? And, th and that's really the issue. And so, uh, and it's a good issue at that. And so just pray with us. And we want to just keep you guys uh, informed in what's happening. But just pray with us because we don't want to do anything without the Spirit leading us and prompting us and guiding us to do it. Because if Christ is not in it, it's not worth it. Amen? So uh, thank you, you guys, for just being such a warm and, and uh, generous church. And, uh, you know, I'm not at the point of Moses yet where I'm saying stop giving. I'm not there yet, and, and I doubt I'll ever get there. But, um, but you guys are just amazing. As you guys see, we have a five-Sunday month, and we're overshooting our, our goal. And, again, we just go before God. God, what would you have us do um, in reaching more lives for the, the gospel of Christ? So amen? Cool. Turn your Bibles to Genesis 2. Hold your finger there, put another finger in Ephesians 5, and then with those two fingers, then put another, no, just two fingers. It's a, it's a two-finger Sunday morning where we're going to go into the word, Genesis 2, Ephesians 5. Um, heard an interesting story this week. Now, I know most of us do not like to run. I'm just going to put that out there. Any runners out there that just love running? Okay, yeah, like I said, there's two weird people here this morning, so... Love you guys. Praise God for your weirdness. But most of us, if, if, if someone said, hey, go run a mile, we're all like, no, thank you, right? 
uh, even though I have run a marathon in my life, and I check it off my bucket list, and uh, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, I made it across the finish line, all right, just FYI, uh, and then woke up in an emergency room. So that's another story for another time. But most of us don't like to run, but there's an interesting race that's taking place in Texas, um, and uh, they're holding a race. It's called the Beer Run, um, and uh, the race is 0.5 kilometers. So it's not a 5K, it's a 0.5K. So if you do your math, it's actually 0.31 miles long. And um, what's amazing about this race, or maybe not so amazing, that there's even a break in the middle for coffee and donuts. In case, it, in case the 0.5K is just too long for you, uh, in the middle there's coffee and donuts, and there's beer at the start and end of the race. And uh, so if the thought of running a marathon seems overwhelming or even a 10K, well, the town of Bourne, Texas has catered to the underachiever in all of us, right? And uh, they will even give you a sticker for the back of your car to brag about your underachievement, right? Like, honey, am I seeing that correctly? 0.5K? And uh, boy, it's like, the things that we, we celebrate, right? Like underachieving. And, and when it comes to the topic of marriage, we're not going to celebrate underachieving. As your pastor, as your friend, as your brother in Christ, I am here to remind us all that the bar has been set high. That as, as we journey through this world, and majority of us will get married, that the, the job of being a husband, the job of being a wife, there is no place for underachieving. As a matter of fact, it will take every ounce of strength, it will take every ounce of wisdom, it will take every ounce of all that we have to make our marriages what God wants them to be. So underachievement in marriage is not an option. And so what we began to talk about last week in Genesis 2, uh, we're going to flesh out and tease out a little bit more today and next week as far as the role and responsibility of a husband today and the role and responsibility of a wife next Sunday. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that this is material that would be good for several messages. So you're getting a one Sunday cliff note version of this topic. And as I've spoken on this topic before in my pastorate, ever since I was a college pastor to planting two churches, I always go back and, and, and rework the material. So this week, I didn't just take out a, an old sugar stick message out of my files and go, oh, I preached this message 15 years ago, so I'm going to share it with you this morning. This is new material because in 15 years, in five years, I've grown not only in understanding what God is telling what husbands look like, but I've grown as a husband myself. As a fact, matter of fact, someone once said that my wife, in the course of so many years, she's been married to five different men, all of them me. Right? I mean, here's the reality of it, is that we grow, we change, we evolve, we morph. And, and the idea that I, 10 years ago, would have known everything about being a husband, I would be lying to you. And so I've come once again to the word, and I'm going, God, what would you want husbands and wives and men and women to hear this morning? And next week, what... Uh, what would we want to, to hear about wives from God's word? And this is good stuff. Whether you've been married, whether you are married, whether you plan on getting married, this is great material because not only does it come from God's word, but Christ is showcased front and center. And that's the thing we can't get away from. That in Genesis 2, Ephesians 5, we're going to tease out the mystery that marriage is really a reflection of Christ's love for his church. So we're going to unpack that here in a moment. I was excited because I was talking to my kids the other day. We were walking into Avengers Affinity War, and let me just tell you, you guys need to see that movie. But I was actually telling, I was asking them, what are you guys most excited about? What movie this summer? And, you know, we we're all, I'm most excited about Incredibles 2. Anyone else with me on that one? 
What I love about Incredibles is that it gives us an honest picture of a family just stressed out, burnt out, trying to get along with each other, yet they have these amazing, uncanny superpowers that they're trying to leverage for the good of the world. Well, in Incredibles 1, I love the Samuel Jackson character, uh, whose name is Lucius Best, but his, his character's name is Frozone. Remember, he's, he's, getting, he's trying to find his outfit. He's screaming at his wife, where's my outfit? I've got to go you know, save the world for the greater good. And his wife screams out from the back room, greater good? She goes, I'm your wife, and I'm the greatest good you're ever going to get. <laughs> and that, that phrase just sticks in my mind. I'm like, men, you need to understand how true that phrase is. Your wife, outside of Jesus Christ, is going to be the greatest good you ever get. So let's unpack that this morning. Three points we're going to look at. Number one, the pattern for husbands. The pattern for husbands. Number two, the practice of husbands. And number three, the promise for husbands. So what's the pattern? Turn to Genesis 2. We see verse 18. Man gives name to the animals, right? One, one again, one, once again, showcasing his power and dominion over creation. He is God's co-regent, right? God is sovereign, but yet he's given man and woman this, this co-regency to subdue and rule over creation. But yet, among all the animals, there was not a helper found suitable for Adam. So what does God do? He causes a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and takes a rib and forms and fashions woman, and brings them together. We saw this last week. We have the first picture of marriage, right? God the Father literally presenting to man his bride. And it says that man and woman were both naked and not ashamed. They became one flesh. And there's this, this union there at the end of, of chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 24 and 25, that sets for us the, the essence of, of marriage, incredible vulnerability, incredible transparency, and they were both naked and not ashamed. And this is important to understand because this is all part of God's creation order. This is part of uh, what is best for our world. This is what's best for community, that marriage is between one man and one woman that become one flesh for one lifetime. Remember we talked about that last week? So one man, one woman, one flesh for a lifetime. Within that relationship, this is where we get to grow close. We get to grow intimate with another human being, uh, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. And we're going to talk about that this morning. And that, the, uh, that the, the, the fruitfulness of that relationship, one of the things is procreation, that God has given us marriage so that we can fill the earth. This was part of God's command. He has wired man and woman in a way that they can come together and literally be that physical one flesh, uh, have sexual intimacy, not only for pleasure, but sexual intimacy for procreation. And only in that context should that intimacy be experienced, okay? So you're hearing me correctly that sex is reserved for marriage, Sex is to be experienced because it is a covenant-making uh, activity where every time you have intercourse with your husband or wife, it is ratifying the, the importance of covenant, that we are connected, we are committed for the rest of our lives. So there's permanence involved, that we don't believe in this, this message that free love, free sex, go sleep with whoever you want. No, that's not true. You have sex with your spouse, and that's the only person you have sex with. Amen? Tell that to a world that doesn't believe that. Right? This is where self-control comes in. Because you don't give in to all your desires. We don't live in a world, and we don't have a, a, a Bible that tells us, just go, whatever feels good, do it. Sorry, Sprite, and your crazy dumb logo, Right? You know, whether it be Nike, just do it, uh, image is everything, Sprite. You know, that's not the way we live our lives. And so what we have to understand is that God created this marriage for a reason. One woman, one man, one flesh for a lifetime. But he's given within this relationship different responsibilities and roles for the man or for the woman. I mean, we would all 
be wise to say we're different, aren't we? Are men and women different? Yes. Is there equality in who we are? You better believe it. We are equally valued in the eyes of God because all of us have been created in the image of God. But all of us are different. We're wired differently, and we are given different roles and responsibilities. We even see this in the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. One God, three persons that all have different roles when it comes to creation, when it comes to salvation. So you're foolish to say that we are all the same and we all have the same roles and same responsibilities. No, we don't. So how do we understand our differences and how do we leverage those differences in the marital context for the glory of God? Hence the reason today's about husbands, next Sunday's about wives. So turn to Ephesians chapter 5 if you would. So Genesis 2 is the jumping off point. Jesus affirms Genesis 2 when he's confronted with a question about marriage. He affirms that it's one man, one woman, one flesh for a lifetime. Paul, the Apostle Paul, affirms this teaching in Ephesians chapter 5. And I think we have this one on the screen. Ephesians 5, uh, verse 31, 32. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Genesis 2. This mystery, and then he expands on it. He says, this was a mystery back in Moses' day. But I'm saying to you that that mystery has now been made known, and it it refers to Christ in the church. So the first point in your notes is the pattern for marriage is Christ and his church. And this is the most important principle we can understand about marriage. Marriage exists to reflect the glory of God that the gospel is awesome, that the gospel is more glorious than we ever imagined, and that now my earthly marriage is somehow, some way meant to reflect Christ's love for the church. Now, I'm not going to look to an earthly marriage because we all fall short. We all make mistakes. We all have problems. We all are kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Amen? We're not looking to earthly marriage for a picture of the gospel, Christ loving the church. We're going to look toward Christ in the church and understand what does that mean for my earthly marriage. This is why the responsibility in understanding these things is so great. That now God has given me this woman that I now call wife, and we get to share our lives together, and this is more than us being happy in marriage. This is more than us having children. This is about us playing a role in sharing with the world the most important message ever, that Christ loves people. And we see in Ephesians chapter 5 why this is so important. And yet... The struggle is what happens in Genesis 3. So I left you kind of with a cliffhanger in Genesis 2. Man, woman, they're naked, not ashamed, right? It would be all fine, well, and good if we just left the story right there. But then Genesis 3 happened. The fall takes place. Man and woman disobey and rebel against God. Then sin enters the world. Now here's the struggle. Where a man is supposed to love his wife, unconditionally, sacrificially. Now you have one of two situations playing out in most marriages. Either there's hostile domination by a husband or there's lazy indifference. Right? My husband is too overbearing and dominating or my husband has checked out and he just doesn't care. And hence now the struggle that has existed for thousands of years. And it's not that the role and responsibility that God had initially given man and woman is is wrong. What's bad is that sin has now twisted our understanding of what it means to be man and woman, husband and wife. So now the mystery in Ephesians is made known to us, and now we have a clearer understanding. It's Christ in the church. So two things you need to understand. That the pattern for husbands... It begins by believing. You start by believing the gospel is our only hope. 
And can you write that down and, and, and remember this for the rest of your lives, that there is no healing, there's no help, there's no hope without the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel is, and I, and I, and I hate to even say good news, I'm going to tell you right now, gospel is the greatest news. That God chose to love you when you didn't deserve it. He came down to this world. He lived a life. He died a death, was buried and rose again so that you and I, through belief, can have eternal life. So every relationship, specifically even the marital relationship, the one we're talking about this morning, is helped by believing the gospel. I wonder how couples do it who don't have Christ. I wonder how people even make it day to day without having the hope that is found through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you, and Tim Keller said it like this, marriage is so much like salvation on a relationship with Christ that Paul says you can't understand marriage without looking at the gospel. So you have to start with the gospel. You have to Keep that in mind that the gospel is, is not only a wonderful message, but it's also a painful message. You think that the eternal life that Jesus earned for you came without pain and came without sacrifice? I mean, you don't look at that final week of Jesus and see him betrayed and see him beaten and see him scourged and see him spat upon and see the crown of thorns and see him crucified without thinking love comes at a painful cost. And what we have to remember is that the gospel is not only wonderful news, but it's also painful news. And I'm glad Jesus took the pain that I should have taken, but he did it for me. The gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. And at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus than we ever dared hope. And that is the only kind of relationship that brings transformation. So that's where we, we start. Now, sustaining the gospel, we don't forget about the gospel we have to keep the gospel in front of us. Where most marriages fail is that one or both of the spouses cease to believe in the gospel. The moment you take your eyes off the gospel is the moment trouble happens. And so sustain Growth and hope and help is found by beholding. You cannot get that out of your mind's eye. You cannot lose sight of the very thing that is so critically important to your life as an individual and your life as a couple. So you start by believing, you're sustained by beholding. Look at 2 Corinthians 3.18 up on the screen. Look at Paul says, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. And this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. See, notice the key to transformation. Beholding the glory of the Lord. The moment you, you take your eyes off him is the moment things start to fall apart. The moment you cease beholding is the moment you cease becoming. You become what you behold. And the moment I get my eyes off Christ, who is the one who has left me as this model, who, is, who has given me this picture of what love ought to look like because of his love for the church, that is the pattern. The moment I cease to see that, the moment things start to fall apart. C.S. Lewis said this, it is probably impossible to love any human being too much. You may love him or her too much in proportion to your love for God, but it is the smallness of your love for God, not the greatness of your love for the person that constitutes the inordinacy. Do you know what that means? 
marriage will strangle us unless we have a really great, true, existential love relationship with God. When you are enraptured, when you are captivated, when you are enthralled, when you see and behold the glory of God, and it's not a glory that checks out at 5 p.m. and comes back 8 a.m. the next morning. It is a glory that is radiating from the throne room of grace right here, right now, where there's angels gathered, myriads upon myriads, shouting, singing, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. He is deserving of honor and praise and glory. There is a worship fest going on right now, and there are other angelic beings, and there's other people that have known Jesus who have passed on who are beholding the glory of the Lord, and yet we are doing it through somewhat of a, of a sinful world, but yet the glory is still there. You, what your heart is able to see, what your mind's eye is able to capture, is to keep focused and keep fixated on the glory of Jesus. It's coming through, and it takes work. And I'm not going to tell you it's easy, but I'm going to tell you right now that the moment you stop beholding is the moment you stop becoming. You will become like that which you behold. This is why most men today have no clue. Because they have beholden a, a dad who didn't model anything close to what Jesus would look like. There are neighbors, there are teachers, there are mentors in a lot of our lives that, you know, we thought we knew what masculinity was and it was so far off the mark. You know, we have grown up with people thinking Homer Simpson is the, the, the poster child for for husbandry or, or fathering or, or Al Bundy. Remember Al Bundy? Yeah, what a great... Or maybe today it's, it's Phil Dunphy. I don't know who your husband, father, model is, but I'm going to tell you, TV and movies get it wrong. They get it wrong, and yet that's the very thing we subject ourselves to, and we behold, we become what we behold. There is no substitute for beholding Jesus and becoming like him. Because this is the promise of God. He will conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. According to Romans chapter 8. He is the one who began a good work in you and will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 1. We are being transformed. And even though the outer man is decaying, the inner man is being renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. So ladies and gentlemen, be hopeful. God has not left us without understanding. He has not left us without instruction. So the pattern for us as husbands is Jesus. And it comes through that not only in believing the gospel so that we are now in a position to grow and to mature, but now we keep pressing on toward him. And write down this, this passage and read it this week, Philippians chapter 3. Paul says, I'm going to run with my eyes fixed upon him. I'm going to consider the things of this world as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ, the, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. That I'm going to consider everything worthless for the sake of pursuing him with, with all that I have. So there is the pattern. That you can only be a husband, you can only be a father, you can only be a man spiritually if you're growing in your own knowledge of God and love for God. Which brings us to now the practice. And there's two things I want to emphasize with practice, and it's this. That we are called to servant leadership, and we are called to costly grace as men and husbands and fathers. And yet, we are to do these things with a kindness. There's a verse I shared with my wife this week, Colossians chapter 3, verse 19. Look up on the screen, it says this. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Interesting, huh? One verse, one bit of instructions Paul wants to send to the Colossian church. Husbands, I got, I got two things I want to tell you. Love your wives. And don't be harsh with them. Now, why does Paul isolate this idea of men being harsh? Because we can be easily frustrated. Yeah? 
We can, we can be easily like frustrated and just like lose our temper and get angry and say things we don't mean and, and do things we don't intend to. And you know, Paul, I think his instructions are wise here. Because again, going back to the gospel, if Christ is the husband and the church is his bride, has Jesus been harsh with us? But he has shown us kindness. And it's his kindness, according to Romans, that has led us to repentance. Amen? So could it be that kindness is the linchpin for change in our relationships? It is God's kindness that has led us to repentance, change. So men, don't be harsh with your wife. That is counterproductive. Man, I can't seem to be moving anything with my, my wife. The needle just kind of is there, and I'm not seeing any change. And, I mean, I yelled at her last night for this. And I got mad at her about this. I'm like, dude, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're not going to get anywhere by acting this way. Right? Don't be harsh. But be kind. And that kindness comes through in two ways. Kindness and servant leadership and kindness and costly grace. Now, I'm going to tell you right now that, you know what? There, we put too much of an expectation upon our spouse. Men do it with their wives, and, and ladies do it with their husbands. I remember Lori and I first started dating, and, you know, she, uh, things were getting serious, and she showed me in the back of her Bible this list of 30 qualities she wanted to find in a future husband. Now, at that point, I'm sitting there going, man, should I just walk right now? Should I just walk and just avoid just like, just being like, boy, I'm glad I met 14. Are you willing to just stick it out with me, right? Like, so she had a list of 30 things, right? And I'm like, okay, let me see the list, right? And, uh, you know, that's, we all operate our lives by list, right? And all of a sudden, you know, I'm going down the list. I'm like, I'm feeling better. Like, ooh, okay, I can do, the, I miss one quality that I couldn't sing. She wanted someone who could sing. And she goes, you know, I'm willing to negotiate on that one. I was like, sweet. So you're saying there's a chance, right? And so out of the list of 30 things, I met 29 of those qualities. Yay, and here we are 26 later. It's 26 years later, right? But here's the thing I want to just tell you, and, and, I, and a mentor told me this years ago. We always marry the wrong person. Okay? We always marry the wrong person. And what he meant by that is that the moment you get married because you think you've known this person enough that you're marrying the right person, but if you realize you always marry the wrong person because what inevitably happens is change sets in. All of a sudden now, you're in this union we call marriage, and all of a sudden things happen. You grow, you evolve, you morph, you change. And all of a sudden, you're looking at the person you've married, and they're different than the person you said those vows to 10 years ago, 20 years ago, three months ago. I don't know. But the point is this. The assumption is that there's someone just right for us to marry, and that if we look closely enough, we're going to find the right person. You will always marry the wrong person. The primary problem is this, learning how to love and care for the stranger that you said I do to or I will to, to find out what they're becoming and you're becoming because that's what marriage does. It brings change. And I'm not always going to say it brings positive change, but I will tell you that there is hope for those who are in a covenant marriage relationship where both have their eyes on Jesus that good change is bound to happen. Now, I will tell you that, like I said before, my wife has seen me morph into different men. So to say that my wife's been married to at least five men in our 26 years of marriage, but yet she's been married to the same guy is one of those thoughts like, oh, that's interesting. And I hope and pray that the man I am today far exceeded the dreams of the man she married 26 years ago. And that for her as a wife, that she has become a woman that I said 26 years ago, I do too, 
and what God has been able to transform in this relationship is something that exceeded my understanding and my dreams. You guys, you guys get what I'm, I'm talking about? And this is going to happen. There's two things you need to consider, men, that is going to bring about this change. Number one, your kindness and servant leadership. And number two, your kindness and costly grace. Let's talk about that. When you hear the word servant, it usually doesn't fall well, especially to a man's ears, right? Yet I, I was humbled with my son. So my father-in-law got remarried, was it six, seven years ago? And uh, my little Hudson at the time was three years old, four years old. And Hudson was going around a, a week, two weeks before the wedding, announcing to everyone that he had a special role in his grandfather's wedding. And everyone was like, what are you going to do? Because he was just like so excited. And every time someone asked him, well, what are you going to do in the wedding? He said, I'm going to be the servant. Like, what does that mean? Like, I'm just going to go and I'm going to serve. And I'm like, my, I'm, my heart just melted. And I'm going, who gets excited about being the servant? Right? Yet this little three, four-year-old little boy just spoke to me a, a, a wonderful word that is embodied in the, in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. That he, Jesus, did not come to be served, but to serve. If there's one thing that typifies the ministry of Christ is that his mentality was to place others as more important than himself. That he came and he ministered to people who welcomed it, and then there are people that rejected it. But that didn't stop him from serving. I mean... No one in the upper room that was fighting about who is the greatest in the kingdom among those disciples, not one of them when Jesus came into the room and not a word was spoken by Jesus when he put, picked up the basin of water and the towel and started to wash their feet, they, they, uh, feet, no one doubted who was the leader at that moment. He didn't say anything, and yet he did the most servile of all tasks. Servanthood doesn't nullify leadership, it defines it. And men, you exist to serve your wife, not the other way around. And that servant leadership is a leadership and a servanthood that is joyful and it is glad. It is one of those things where you gladly empty yourself and empty yourself of your selfish comforts for the betterment of your wife. Your objective is her joy. Your objective is her hope. Your objective is her um, uh, uh, fulfilling things that she's dreaming about. You exist to serve her, not the other way around. We don't enter marriage with the mentality that I married her to keep the chips and dip coming. Wrong! And yet there's guys that, again, whether it be hostile domination or lazy indifference, your wife does not exist to make sure your NFL draft parties are everything they need to be. You exist to serve her. You have not entered the marriage to be served. You have entered the marriage to serve and to do it joyfully. For the joy set before Jesus, Hebrews chapter 12, he endured the cross, despised the shame. Why? Because of the crown that lay beyond it. And men need to grow in their serving mentality. You exist to serve your wife lovingly. You exist to serve your wife gently. You exist to serve your wife compassionately. You exist to serve your wife graciously. This is a hard thing to do. I am not telling you this is easy. But there was a time when I would not touch a dirty dish in the sink. You can call me an ass. It's okay. I was. Like, hey, what are you going to do with the dishes? Like, and she's like, well, what do you, I, I'm, I don't do dishes. Like, was that part of the marital, like, uh, vows? Like, oh, yeah, and there's a little caveat here. I don't do dishes. And I'm not here to brag about myself, but you know what I actually really like doing today? <laughs> Dishes. And if that's one way to serve her, then God has convicted my heart and said, you do it. 
you do whatever it takes to bring joy into her life. You don't exist to be a burden. You exist to bring joy and hope to this woman you have covenanted your life to forever. So serving your wife, and how do you serve uh, your wife and lead her in this way? There's two things I think of. um, Sacrificing and, and sanctifying. You lead by sacrificing and you lead by sanctifying. Ephesians chapter 5, look up on the screen. Here's how Paul unpacks it. He says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now that is the greatest of all sacrifices. He gave his life for us. And who here is thrilled that God would show us such love? All of us. I pray I would never experience a time where I have to give my life for my wife, but I would do it gladly. I'll take a bullet for her. I will die for her. And yet that very spirit is so healthy for any marital relationship. For a woman to know my husband will protect me, he will provide for me, he will give his very life so that I can experience good. That's what Je- is that not what Jesus does for us? So, love, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her. Make her holy. We're going to get to that here in a moment. And he's having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That she might be holy and without blemish in the same way husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his, him, loves, his wife loves himself. For no one has ever hated his own flesh but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church. This is such a huge passage of scripture. And I only want to note two things. Number one, a husband is known by his, his spirit of sacrifice, leading in this way, and number two, by sanctifying. So let's just unpack the sacrificing one more time because last week I, I gave you guys a Keller quote that said this, if two spouses each say to each other, I'm going to treat my self-centeredness as the main problem in the marriage, you have the prospect for a truly great marriage. Let's be honest, the, the greatest thing God is going to weed out of your hearts is your self-centeredness. There's no institution in this world like marriage that's going to confront you with how selfish a person you are. And God is going to keep you there, and it's going to perhaps get more difficult than it's going to get better. But God is faithful to perfect the work that he's going to do in you. And and I'm going to tell you right now that the focus is always on you. There's so many times that Lori and I will get together with couples and we'll try to hash out issues, problems, conflict, And the thing that I always press upon the individual is what do you need to work on? Because if your fixation is on what they need to change, you'll never move the needle. You'll never advance. You'll never get healthy. There'll never be hope because you're missing out on what God wants to show you. So I've got a husband on the phone. I've got a wife on the phone. Here's what I'm asking them. What is God revealing to you about your heart? What is he showing to you about your life? And if I'm on the phone with your wife or if I'm on the phone with your husband, I'm going to ask them the same question. Because this is not a tit-for-tat argument about what their issues are. We are going to talk about what's going on right here because marriage is the great revealer of all those dark, hidden sins that we all have buried deep within us. And some of us don't want to hear that. Right? We're sitting there going, I hate you, pastor. That's not what it's about. It's exactly what it's about. Because it's exactly what the gospel does. Shows me what a sinner I am. Shows me how wretched I am. Paul says he's the chief of sinners. Are you kidding me? When the gospel light of Jesus showed in my heart, I want to run like a cockroach to the dark, deep, dank dungeons of my sin and not come clean. But yet he called me, Scott, come forth. And instead of be dead, be alive, I came forth. Only by his grace and only by his spirit, he showed me things about my heart that I did not want to be revealed, and yet he did it in the context of love and grace and mercy. He saved me not for condemnation. He saved me for salvation. It is ugly and it is nasty, and yet God has given us marriage as that earthly revealer of those things that we would soon avoid. It's so not about ease, and it's so not about comfort. And yet, what does Jesus establish at the very 
very start, if you're going to be his disciple, what does he establish as here are the basic rules if you want to be a disciple of Jesus? Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Not, hey, make sure you change your wife and her life, and then you can come and follow after me. Hey, you know what? Change your kids from being rebellious to obeying, and then you can follow me. Notice the onus of Jesus, and not just Jesus, but throughout the entire Bible, the onus is always on what is going on here. If I'm going to follow Jesus, this is where the greatest work is to be done. And it's going to come through loud and clear in my marriage relationship. If anyone wants to come after Jesus, he says, let him deny himself. Isn't that what marriage is? Men is a constant denial of you. It is a constant crucifying of you. And it's a constant following, i.e. beholding of him. So sacrifice is so important. And let me ask you, what did God sacrifice to win your heart? One word, everything. The moment someone is not willing to sacrifice something to make their relationship better is the moment that is a starved and strangled relationship. And it may be severe. Husbands, in order to save your marriage, you might have to give up the hobby you love so much, shooting Nerf guns in other men's faces. You know, you might have to give that up. You ever thought about this? You may have to give up a relationship. Maybe there's a guy in your life that just... Bad company corrupts good character. And your wife's been telling you, you know, this, his influence on your life is not good. What's more important, your friendship or your marriage? Maybe he's saying you need to leave that job. Maybe there's situations going on at work that are not good for, for you or even your relationship with your wife. Maybe there's temptation at work. I, I don't know what it is. But the moment you say, I can't sacrifice this for the better of my relationship, you have an idol that God wants to destroy. Because you put supreme value on something that you're looking to bring satisfaction that in the end is going to leave you dead end and empty. You, you need to know that I'm being stern and I'm being forthright right now because I've seen too many marriages wrecked for stupid reasons. Because a man refused to let go of something and it destroyed his wife and his family. And unfortunately, a lot of those relationships today, they are rock bottom, empty, and now that man is crushed and destroyed. There's no character, there's no integrity, there's no wife, there's no kids. Guys, no expense is too much to pay for your marriage to be everything God wants it to be. Amen? I know I didn't get a lot of amens. I wasn't looking for it, just so you guys know. <laughs> so the essence of marriage is this sacrificial commitment that I will sacrifice anything to make this relationship better. That's the spirit. And as you're beholding Christ and pursuing him, he will show you what you need to drop. Discipleship is a journey of continually letting go of things of this world to gain the things of eternal value. That's what discipleship is. Letting go of the things you thought important. In eternity, your car does not matter. The kind of car you drive, the job you have, the title you have at work. All your possessions, all your that means nothing because naked you came into the world, naked you're, you're going to exit. And what is it that you are going to present to Christ? According to Ephesians 5, it seems as though I'm going to be held accountable for how well I love my wife. Now, men, think about that. You want a sobering reality right here, right now? Jesus is saying to you, so, Michael, how did you do in loving your wife? Tim, I gave you this wonderful gift of a, of a, of a wife. How did you do? Scott, did you sacrifice for her? Did you, did you seek to sanctify her? Because it seems as though that is what I'm going to be held accountable for. He's not going to say, so, did you have a domestic or import car? Good choice on the Honda. Well done, Scott. Enter into the joy of your master, right? Like, Let me talk about sanctifying. You lead by sanctifying, meaning 
you have the primary responsibility to lead your wife and your family into morally and spiritually beneficial pastures. As a husband, I have, notice I said primary responsibility, not sole responsibility. My wife and I are a team. But he is looking to me to take the initiative, and that is the big word right there. I must learn how to initiate morally and spiritually beneficial seasons for my family to live and grow in. And again, as I'm beholding Christ, I'm going to start to understand those things as the Spirit works within me, as I'm beholding Christ. He's going to show me what is morally and spiritually beneficial and what's not. There have been times I have made mistakes even as a pastor. I mean, we go see lots of movies, right? That's one of our favorite things to do. Once a week, we go see a movie, and this week was Infinity War with the kids, so they infringe upon our date day, and I allowed that to happen one time, all right? But sometimes we go, and there have been a handful of movies. You know what I said? I said, you know what? This is not good. Let's, let's leave. There was something going on in the film. There was some sort of content that was just, it was just, and she, she told me later, thank you for taking the initiative to remove us from an environment that was not going to be good for our spirit. All right, so I wish I got that, that $16 back from the movie theater. There's part of me going, man, I really want. But deep down inside, there's a little, little price to be paid for protecting the spiritual life that God wants to grow. And that I have to realize that there are things that I allow into our marriage, into our home that inhibit that. And it would be good for me to continue to keep and step with the Spirit to recognize this is not good for my family. This is not good for my marriage. And so we're constantly taking an assessment, and I need her to help me see what maybe what I'm not seeing, that I have a responsibility to see her grow in holiness. Here's what Keller says. What keeps the marriage going is your commitment to your spouse's holiness. I love that. What that means is we are going to make Jesus a priority. As for me and my house, here's what the Old Testament says, we will serve the Lord. We will make it a priority to come to Sunday morning, the collective gathering of this church family, because that's what it is. This is a gathering of a community. And we will make it a priority. And, and kids' sports and my NFL team, and this, those things are secondary. This is important. So that means right now, if you're within earshot, whether the Cardinals play at 10 a.m. on a Sunday, or 6 p.m., you're saying this is priority number one. There's this thing called TiVo or DVR. You can do it. It's interesting when men swear their allegiance to a team and they're willing to say, yeah, the, gather, the weekly gathering of the saints is not as important as me slugging some beers and watching my team. Am I, am I right? I will make this a priority. Well, I kind of have to. It's kind of my vocation and my calling, right? Like, where's Pastor Scott? It's like, oh, he's at home watching the game, right? Like, but I'm telling my wife and my kids, guess what? This is priority. And during the week, if there's an opportunity to be in a small group, I want to be a part of that. If there's an opportunity to grow and, and foster the spiritual life of Christ in us, I'm going to do that. Conversation last night as I'm putting my boys to bed, my son, my little guy asked me, Dad, am I old enough to be baptized? And I'm like, so glad he's thinking about that. Well, what does that mean? And, and, you know, his brother, he goes, I asked Addison, and he said, I don't know. <laughs> like, good help you are, Addison, right? Like, well, if Addison doesn't know, I don't know. Go to bed, all right? And then, no, I'm like, I'm there to cultivate that and bring that out. And so as a husband, I have the, the, the responsibility to, to bring that stuff to the surface. We're talking at dinner, right? What, what are some verses? We're, and it's not perfect. We don't sit down. This, don't envision in your mind like some little house in the prairie scene where we're sitting at the table and we've all got our Bibles open. And there are times we don't pray as a family. There are times we don't read the Bible. And you're saying, oh, but you're the pastor. No, I'm a human being and I'm a man who's trying to make it just like you are. And there's times I forget and there's times I don't make it a priority. So don't hear what I'm not saying. It's not perfect. But it is at the front. And we're trying to pursue it together. Are you leading your family by seeking ways to sanctify your wife, 
and your kids. Now here's the big question. What if there's a husband that doesn't lead this way, ladies? Okay, I'm presenting you a picture and you're sitting there going, sounds great, but my husband's not, not doing that. He's not like that. Your hope is not whether your husband leads like Jesus. Your hope is found, according to Ephesians 5, in your submission to Jesus, who is your ultimate Lord. So what's difficult is when you have a husband that doesn't lead like Jesus, you still have a lordship that you fall under that is going to be perfect and is going to be uh, exactly where it needs to be because he loves you more than you can ever imagine. And he's going to take care of you more ways than you ever thought possible. So this is the hope, right? We, you don't submit to your husband. And, and I'm going to talk about submission. Next, and here's the bad word in the church. Ladies, your role is not to submit to your husband. We're going to blow submission out of the water next week. Can't you wait for that to happen, right? Submission has been this way the church has done a great disservice to, to the marriage union. A woman's role is not submission. What is it? You've got to wait till next week to hear about it. But I will tell you, the hope, again, is not that your husband leads like Jesus. Your hope is in Jesus himself. But you can pray for your husband. Because if your hope is that your husband leads like Jesus and he doesn't lead like Jesus, then your expectation of your husband is unrealistic and unfulfilled and hence an idol and it's going to bring defeat into your heart. So you look beyond your husband and who is the ultimate head of the church? Christ Jesus. And that's who you submit to. And then you just trust and you pray and you hope that God tackles your husband's heart. Amen? Let me stop right there. My, my wife's nodding. Are we connecting? Thank you. See you later. <laughs> this is how we stoke the fires right here. You know what I'm saying? So anything, anything you'd like to add to that? It's crazy, isn't it? Like, right, well. Yeah. What Lori just said. So, guys, it is hard without the Spirit's help. God will never ask you to do something he's not ready to empower you to do. Remember this. And when you feel submitted to the Spirit so that He is able to do in you what you never thought possible, what you will have in your experience with your wife is a wife that responds favorably, joyfully, willingly to that sort of work of God in you. This has got to be a spirit work, right? It's a, it's a yieldedness, which means, ladies, you don't demand for your husband to be this way. Counterproductive. Well, as soon as you start acting like Jesus is the moment, you get a fresh meal on the table, sucker, right? Like, this is not going to work, right? And, and ultimately, ladies, you don't want demanded obedience from your husband. Because the moment you're in the driver's seat and trying to control your husband is the moment he is shutting down. So it, it's, it is this dance where you sit there and go, well, what? You know what? You focus on what you need to do as husbands, and, and hopefully God promises that, you know, there's something that's going to happen in your marriage. And ladies, you know what? You pray and you be the woman God wants you to be, and ultimately you can't control each other. You can't demand these things of the other. But what Lori is saying is exactly right. When you lead like Jesus, you have a wife that responds so well to that. Right? Do I always look like Jesus in our home? No. There's sometimes my wife says, get thee behind me, Satan. Like, I'm, I'm acting opposite, like antichrist, right? Like, but I, I again, I could be so self-condemning and so, so self-critical. But, the, but she knows the desire's there. She knows that, that that desire and that yearning is there. And, and that is what has not made our relationship perfect, because it will never be perfect this side of eternity, but that's what has kept it going and has given us hope. Amen?
So, uh, real quick, so costly grace. Let me talk about this. What I mean by costly grace is this. You're going you're gonna to do things as a husband. You're going to lead like I'm describing, and it may not be reciprocated. You're, you're, you don't do it to get something out of it. See, grace is giving something that the other person doesn't deserve. It comes at great cost because you're going to press in. And you're going to give. You're going to sacrifice. You're going to seek for ways to make your wife holy, right? And your family holy. And you may not be applauded. You may not be appreciated. You know, all those things that sometimes we as men want, right? You may not be shown respect. But the reason grace is, is costly is because of that reason. Do you think Jesus on the cross gets total allegiance out of his church? Are there seasons you and I disobey? And does that mean that we nullify the grace of God? No, it's still there. But I tell you what, we take it for granted, don't we? We abuse God's grace. And so it's costly because there's the potential for that happening. But we are gracious in two areas. Number one, we are gracious in serving and we are gracious in speaking. I will serve my wife as Christ has served me. And how has Christ served me? He has served me in every area. Imaginable and every area unimaginable. And my wife needs to know that she is going to experience the same. There's nothing I will withhold to make her better. So the grace in serving is uh, no strings attached. There's no ledger keeping. People are good ledger keepers, aren't they? We're going to keep track of all the things done and all the things said. No, 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 no. There is no strings attached. I will serve you as Christ has served me. And how has Christ served me? He has served me in everything. And number two, speaking. And this is perhaps where men can be harsh, according to Colossians 3, where we have to be reminded of Ephesians 4, verse 29. Let no unwholesome word, no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for the building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Men, you do not exist to belittle your wives. Men, you do not exist to talk beneath them or above them. You do not exist to demean them or or criticize them. Your wife is a trophy, a precious treasure given to you from God. You speak to her words of grace. You show her love because that's that's how Jesus speaks to us. He doesn't save us and then say, you loser. He doesn't save us and say, you idiot. But he says to us, words of grace. He affirms who we are in him. He encourages our identity in him. He speaks words as as fitting for the moment that is exactly what we need to hear for our good, not to set us back. And so there needs to be grace in what we say and how we say it. Some things don't need to be said, men. Some things need to be tempered with a different tone. Instead of reacting, respond, which means you stop and you think about what you want to say and how you want to say it. You don't just, bah! Too much verbal diarrhea has damaged relationships. And that's what it is, bah! Right? Let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but only that which is good and filled with grace for the moment. And what's the promise? Look at it later, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Peter writes, after he's instructed the wives, verses 1 through 6, verse 7, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as a weaker vessel. We'll talk about that next week. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, and notice the last part, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Men, you do not love your wives the way God wants you to love your wives. Your spiritual life will be hampered. You don't live, you don't understand, you don't seek to love the way Jesus has done those things with you. Guess what's going to happen? Your spiritual life will suffer. So what's the promise? Conversely, if you seek the heart of God and, and live the way I have described for you this morning through his word, you have the promise that your spiritual life will not be hindered. What an awesome promise that is. More next week on the ladies. Anything we need to add? I know it is, totally. So, what are you saying, huh? 
You being mad at me? Look, we'll take care of it later, all right? So um, here's what I'm going to say. If there's any thoughts or any questions, anything lingering, maybe that wasn't clear, please use your communication card. Let me know. I can talk about it maybe next week at the beginning of the service. Uh, call me, email me. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, you've been so good to us, giving us this time together to, to just get a glimpse of your heart on perhaps one of the greatest relationships you have given to the world, and that is the, the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. And Lord, the world has done such a, a messed up job, and yet you've given us clear picture and clear instructions. Lord, help us as men, as, as potential husbands, as husbands that are currently serving in that role, Lord, help us be the men you would want us to be for your glory and for the good of our, our marriages and our families. Thanks for giving us uh, instruction and not leaving us without uh, the course you would have us walk. And, and I pray that all of us here would be encouraged. We would all just once again be reminded of the generous and wonderful love of Christ uh, that helps us live the lives we never thought possible. So thank you for this time with this family, for these brothers and sisters. Guide and direct our steps, Lord. Be glorified in all we say and do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great, great day. We'll see you guys soon. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out thechurchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.